Welcome back to our course, Fundamentals of Operating Systems, based on the text, Operating System Concepts, 10th edition, by Silbershots, Gagney, and Galvin. In the last lesson, we were talking about access methods, and now we're going to proceed to Lesson 4 in this Module 6. And this will be on directory structure, so let's begin. The directory can be viewed as a symbol table that translates file names into their file control blocks. If we take such a view, we see that the directory itself can be organized in many ways. The organization must allow us to insert entries, to delete entries, to search for a named entry, and to list all the entries in the directory. When considering a directory structure, we need to keep in mind the operations that are performed on a directory. We search for a file. We need to be able to search a directory structure to find the entry for a file. Since files have symbolic names, and similar names may indicate a relationship among files, we may want to be able to find all files whose names match a pattern. We also create a file and new files need to be created and added to that directory. And of course we also delete files and so when a file is no longer needed we want to be able to remove it from the directory. Note, a delete leaves a hole in the directory structure and the file system may have a method to defragment that directory structure. Of course we're going to want to be able to list the directory. We need to be able to list the files in a directory and the contents of the directory entry for each file in the list. Contents like access codes, loaners, locations, things like that. We also rename a file, which we've talked about earlier. Because the name of the file represents its contents to its users, we must be able to change the name when the contents or the use of the file changes. Renaming a file may also allow its position within the directory structure to be changed. And of course we want to traverse the file system, so we may wish to access every directory and every file within the directory structure. The simplest directory structure is the single level directory. All files contained in the same directory, which is easy to support, and understand as we see here. A single level directory has significant limitations though. When the number of files increases or when the file system has more than one user, problems arise. Since all files are in the same directory, they must have unique names. If two users call their data file test.txt, then the unique name rule is violated. Fortunately, most file systems support names of up to 255 characters, so it's pretty easy to select unique file names. That hasn't always been true. I remember in the earlier versions of Microsoft DOS, we were allowed 11 characters, an 8-character name, and a 3-character extension. Fortunately, that was changed a long time ago. Even a single user on a single level directory might find it difficult to remember the names of all the files as the number of files increases. It's not uncommon for the user to have hundreds of files on one computer system and an equal number of additional files on another. Shoot, I have thousands of files on my laptop. If I were unable to organize them into subdirectories or subfolders, as some call them, I'd never be able to find anything. Keeping track of so many files is a daunting task. As we've seen, the single level directory often leads to confusion of the file names among different users, even among one user. The standard solution is to create a separate directory for each user. In the two-level directory structure, each user has his own user file directory. The user file directories have similar structures, but each lists only the files 
of a single user. When a user job starts or a user logs in, the master files directory is searched. The master file directory is indexed by username or account number and each entry points to the user file directory for that user as we see in this image. When a user refers to a file, only his own user file directory is searched. Therefore, different users may have files with the same name as long as the file names within each user file directory are unique. To create a file for a user, the operating system searches only that user's file directory to ascertain whether another file of that name exists. To delete a file, the operating system confines its search to the local user file directory. Therefore, it can't accidentally delete another user's file that has the same name. The user directories themselves must be created and deleted as necessary. A special system program is run with appropriate user name and account information. The program creates a new user file directory and adds an entry for it to the master file directory. The execution of this program might be restricted to system administrators. Although the two-level directory structure solves the name collision problem, it still has disadvantages. This structure effectively isolates one user from another. Isolation is an advantage when the users are completely independent, but it's a disadvantage when the users want to cooperate on some task and to access one another's files. Some systems simply do not allow local user files to be accessed by other users. If access is to be permitted, one user must have the ability to name a file in another user's directory. To name a file uniquely in a two-level directory, we must give both the user name and the file name. A two-level directory can be thought of as a tree or an inverted tree of height 2, like this one we see up here. The root of the tree is the master file directory. Its direct descendants are the user file directories. The descendants of the user file directories are the files themselves. The files are the leaves of a tree. Specifying a user name and a file name defines a path in the tree from the root, that's the master file directory, to a leaf, a specified file. Therefore, the username and the file name define a path name. Every file in the system has a path name. To name a file uniquely, a user must know the path name of the file desired. For example, if user A wishes to access his own test file named test.txt, he can simply refer to text.txt. To access the file named test.txt of user B, however, the user must have to refer to slash user B slash test.txt. Every system has its own syntax for naming files and directories other than the user's own. Additional syntax is needed to specify the volume of a file. For example, in Windows, a volume is specified by a letter followed by a colon. Your data might be kept on drive C. That would be the volume identifier for your hard drive. Or it might be on a flash drive identified as drive E, which is the volume ID. So in this case, the file specification might be C colon backslash user B backslash test. Some systems go even further and separate the volume, director name, and the file name parts of the specification. Whenever a file name is given to be loaded, the operating system first searches the local user file directory. If the file is found, it's used. If it's not found, the system automatically searches the special user directory that contains system files. 
The sequence of directories searched when a file is named is called the search path. The search path can be extended to contain an unlimited list of directories to search when the command name is given. If you want to see what yours is, go to the command prompt and then type the word path. You will then see the entire path that the operating system will search to find a file name. This method is the one used in most Unix and Windows systems. Systems can also be designed so that each user has his own search path, which is what you just saw with that path statement. Once we've seen how to view a two-level directory as a two-level tree, the natural generalization is to extend that directory structure to a tree of arbitrary height, as shown here. This generalization allows users to create their own subdirectories and to organize their files accordingly. How many of you put everything you moan on the desktop? That's that folder. That, in fact, is one of the subdirectories of your system. It's called desktop. A tree is the most common directory structure. The tree has a root directory, and every file in the system has a unique path name. A directory or a subdirectory contains a set of files or subdirectories. In many implementations, a directory is simply another file, but it's treated in a special way. All directories have the same internal format. One bit in each directory defines the entry as a file, perhaps binary 0, or as a subdirectory, binary 1. Special system calls are used to create and delete directories. In this case, the operating system implements another file format, that of a directory. In normal use, each process has a current directory. The current directory should contain most of the files that are of current interest to the process. When a reference is made to a file, the current directory is searched. If a file is needed that is not in the current directory, then the user usually must specify a path name or change the current directory to the directory holding that file. You may remember that we type cd backslash in a directory name to change directories. To change directories, a system call would be provided that takes a directory name as a parameter and uses it to redefine the current directory. That CD was a system call. Therefore, the user can change his current directory whenever he wants. I hope you remember our examination of Windows Directory during that early period of our class. Other systems leave this to the application, like a shell, to track and operate on a current directory, as each process could have different current directories. The initial current directory of a user's login shell is designated when the user job starts or when the user logs in. The operating system searches the accounting file or some other predefined location to find an entry for this user for accounting purposes. If the accounting file is a pointer to, or the name of, the user's initial directory, the pointer is copied to the local variable for this user that specifies the user's initial current directory. From that shell, other processes can be spawned. The current directory of any subprocess is usually the current directory of the parent when it is spawned. Path names can be of two types, absolute and relative. In Unix and Linux, an absolute path begins at the root, which is designated in Unix with a forward slash, and it's designated in Windows with a backward slash. And it follows a path down to the specific file, giving the directory names on the path along the way. A relative path name defines a path from the current directory only. For example, in a tree structured file system, like you see here, if the current director is slash spell slash mail, then the relative path name refers to the same file as does the absolute path name. This allows a user to define his own subdirectories, permits him to impose structure on his files. 
The absolute file name includes the entire path to the file. Backslash users, backslash Michael, backslash whatever, whatever, until it is the file name. The relative file name may just include nothing but the file name itself, which means that it would search the current directory, and if the file was not there, it would give up. Allowing a user to define his own subdirectories permits him to impose a structure on his files. This is a structure that I could not get along without. The structure may result in separate directories for files associated with different topics. For example, a subdirectory might be created for homework, another subdirectory for invoices, another directory for letters, whatever the user chooses. An interesting policy decision in a tree structure directory concerns how to handle the deletion of a directory. If a directory is empty, it's entry in the directory that can be simply deleted. However, suppose that a directory to be deleted is not empty, but contains several files or subdirectories. One of two approaches can be taken. Some systems will not delete a directory unless it is empty. Therefore, to delete a directory, the user must first delete all the files in that directory. If any subdirectories exist, this procedure must be applied recursively to them so that they can be deleted also. This approach can result in a substantial amount of work. An alternative approach, such as that taken by the Unix RM command, is to provide an option. When a user request is made to delete a directory, all that directory's files and subdirectories are also deleted. Either approach is fairly easy to implement. The choice is one of policy. That latter policy may be more convenient, but it's also much, much more dangerous because an entire directory structure can be removed with one command. If the command is used in error, a large number of files and directories will need to be restored, assuming that we have a backup. With a tree structure directory system, users can be allowed to access, in addition to their files, the files of other users. For example, user B can access a file of user A by specifying its path name. User B can specify either an absolute or a relative path name. Alternatively, User B can change his or her current directory to be user A's directory and access the file by its name. Of course, this is all assuming that permissions have been assigned to allow user B to do that. Well, there's worlds of other information that we could examine and study when it comes to operating systems and, in fact, file systems. But we have used up our allotted time in this course. And so we are at the end. Go ahead, go over your notes, update your study guides, and maybe someday we'll meet in another online course.